Good evening and welcome to Crawford School. Let me start by acknowledging the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet, uh, paying our respect to elders of the Ngunnawal people, past and present. Uh, my name is Frank Yotso. I direct the Centre for Climate Economics and Policy here at Crawford School. And tonight we're very fortunate to have Professor Jiang Kejun here. He's a senior researcher at the Energy Research Institute in China. Um, and. Uh, really one of China's most prominent researchers in the area of climate change mitigation uh, and energy. He leads a program modeling um, China's energy and environmental policy. Uh, he has been an author of successive uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change reports and is currently uh, a coordinating lead author on the IPCC fifth assessment report. Um, and he's currently here as a guest uh, of the Department of Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, um, together with a delegation of senior Chinese researchers, officials, as well as representatives from a number of the pilot schemes for emissions trading in some of China's cities and provinces. Um, so plenty of opportunity there for discussion um, after Professor Jiang Kejun's talk. Now, I forgot to ask you uh, for, for how much time you've prepared to speak. We've announced the event to uh, go until 7 o'clock, so that gives us 50 minutes. With your permission, we'll take a little bit of the time back that we lost uh, at the start. Um, can I suggest that you may speak for 35 to 40 minutes, just to leave time for, for question and answer? And I may, may give you a 10-minute 10, 10 um, warning as okay. well. Thank okay. You. Please join me in welcoming Professor Frank. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so, so for this campus, I came here many times. But uh, every time you really enjoy a lot. I think it's such kind of a topic um, we present so far is also quite new in China. So I'm happy to share such kind of a study. We just uh, bring this to, to Congress or uh, what happened in the try to put this in the policy making process. But today this presentation I'm go to more technical way, what the modeling we do, why China can do some, some peak CO2 emission before 2025, or follow the next global two degree target. So I use this title like this. Uh, we do the modeling, so we can't want to come back this is top down way. Let's remember that in Copenhagen, in Cancun, in Durban, we, we hold down that a global climate change target will be two degree increase for the temperature by 2100. Compare with that, uh, with the pre industry, that means something like uh, 1850. Uh, but by today, it's nearly all the 0 0.9 degree increase. So we still have something like 1.1 degree to go. But if you think about the, the uh, community effects of greenhouse gas, it's very tough work to do. So far, so many people in China say it's already impossible to, to, to do two degree. But myself, this time I'm, I'm working for IPCC AR5, working group three, I'm in chapter six. Uh, talking about a long-term transition scenario. So, so far, uh, last week, we just submit the, the second order draft available for government to review. The conclusion from that one is uh, uh, from the global modeling, the two degree, so far, so we say it's a feasible because many models say so we can still can do two degree, even though we hold down the Copenhagen commitment. So today, my, my, my job because we do these studies mainly for domestic government, our Chinese government, to, to do our policy making process. Because basically, EI, we belong to NDRC, which is a government agency to make a policy on climate change energy. So this is a fundamental background. The methodology we, are, we, are, we do with that. So this is a picture, actually, uh, the first need also meeting what happened in Seoul. At that time, we collect some data from database of a global modeling team. So you can see if we still want to do two degree, we must go something like this way. This is our engineer. We already have a lot. This is uh, in the IPCC AR4. We already have some figure for this. But this uh, group is quite new. This could be a two, two degree scenario. But many of the scenarios shows that uh, in some time, we have to go to negative emission. Negative emission means uh, all the emissions go to zero. 
together with the biomass IGCC plus CCS. CCS is a carbon capture and storage technology. This, uh, but my colleague is at EI still very strong argument on this. They don't like negative emission because uh, it's also used a lot of energy for CCS system. But uh, China can do leading on that. It's very uncertain. But this is, uh, uh, finally, last uh, week we submitted the second order draft. I think the number of this news is increasing. So many, if you compare with the AR4, uh, working group three report, uh, the big change is uh, for this group. Many senior come out to say that two degree is still okay, we can go ahead with that. So in this case, what happened for China? Now we do the top-down model. We have a global model by our own. This team also the only modeling team from the developing world to join the global modeling start model and to see in our global model what kind of global CO2 emission pathway uh, by 2100. Uh, we also use a lot of success in this period, but not yet go to negative emission. But doing this global model, we can see actually China is here, like this way. We have to pick a CO2 emission by which year. Then come down to this slide. This is three line, I'm, I'm sorry, it's a uh, baseline scenario, which is a low carbon scenario, and also it's a intense low carbon scenario. This is a two degree scenario. This three line, we already published that in before Copenhagen, that's in year 2008. At that time, we get a very big argument that uh, we are the only modeling team in China say China can peak CO2 emission by 2030. Uh, the other modeling team say no, so we are very lonely and we got big trouble, <laughs> even, even in Copenhagen. So because uh, I remember six ministers from Europe took this figure to Chinese minister, say, China should do more because the Chinese commitment for Copenhagen is 40 to 45 percent of a carbon intensity reduction come by 2020 compared with that in to, uh, year 2005. But this is only this BU case. So in the, our baseline, China can do 45 percent carbon intensity, but we have another two lines. So there's some EU colleagues want to push China to do more. They say, okay, this is your government forecast, why not you do more for this? I think the good news is uh, after, after this, by 2010, uh, before that, we try to disclose all the data for the model. Why China can do such kind of peaking by 2030? The good news is by, by mid of uh, all the modeling team in China, they have, they say China will peak CO2 emission before 2030. What does that mean? That means the policy come to true by today. So actually, if you, you see what happened in China, the de delegation is using this line to be their in-house scenario. That means that so far I don't worry about the Chinese policy making to say China will peak CO2 emission before 2030. But the only trouble is that by doing this cannot match with a global two degree target. So this is one combined is, uh, then we try to answer the question for last eight months whether China can peak our CO2 emission before 2025. If China can do this, the global two degree target is still there. If China cannot do this, maybe we can just can give up the two degree target. So this is uh, the way we talk with Chinese colleagues. China must do something, otherwise globally we are failed to do the two degree. So this is the fundamental down to explain why or how China will do such kind of thing. Just similar process we did with the 2030 peaking year uh, research activity to explain to the public. So what we need to talk with the policymakers, we, we cannot based on our experience because EI belongs to government. Every time we, when we join the negotiation, no, we when join the policy making process, the government official will always ask a very detailed question. Why? We should do this. What's the effect for that? That's a good thing. That's uh, also the story we're talking about. Now the in the government official in Chinese policymakers, they are much more educated people. Most of them they have a master degree or PhD. <laughs> so when they start to ask a question, it's no more like uh, 15 years ago. They just want to know your result. You tell us whether it's true or not. But now they want to know the background story. So this is a. Uh, what we can do is uh, we present 
in many opportunity in workshops, in internal meetings, the key factors, which is the key factor to drive to the scenario. And also think about the, the transparency for the modeling. We cannot say by our own. We must invite other modeling team to join us to tell the similar story. So far, by today, it's only our modeling team and maybe another one more modeling team say it's okay to try not to pick CO2 emission before 2025. But we still wait other modeling team to do the similar thing. We need some time to transfer all the data to them. So this, uh, we organized some modeling forum or workshops together. We invited some other modeling team to join us. We present, actually this uh, again happened this Monday. The Monday workshop in Beijing is organized by China Academy for Engineering, who is really the leading research team in China, who, who is the consultant of a Premier. Many times, I think uh, Premier Wen Jiabao called uh, 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 Professor Du Xiangwan for climate change policy. But he organized the Monday meeting. Just because I'm, I'm on the way to come to here, I cannot join that. But my colleague asked me a lot of questions before my departure. <laughs> so he will present for us. But uh, basically, we already present many times. So I, I think there's uh, some modern forum, and we have internal argument. And the policymaker will sit there to see the argument between modelers. So modeling team say no, then we say yes, then we start to argue, and the policy makers say sit there quietly to see what happened between us. So this is one way. Another one way is uh, we make a study for the key factors. Uh, in many ways, for the last uh, six months, we didn't do much for forecast for CO2 and energy. We did a forecast for steel demand, transport demand, yeah, and also cement demand in China. So basically, engineering is not our business. I remember it's, uh, in the 1990s, we asked all the data from industry, how much steel you make forecast in China by 2020. Then we input the data into our model. We're using that forecast. But so far, we don't believe them because all the forecast by them totally wrong. <laughs> so that's the reason why when we do the 12th, five year, no, 11th five-year plan, Many people come, uh, laugh at our team. So you made forecast in year 2000. By 2020, China only increased double energy. Uh, sorry, increased one time, uh, j just double energy demand, but the GDP will, will four times higher. Uh, but double means China will use uh, something like a 26, uh, no, no, uh, 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 2.6 billion ton co-equivalent by 2020. But 2.6 already happened in year 2008. <laughs> it's a very big difference. Why you make such kind of scenario forecast it's totally wrong. So after that, we, we do our, more, our own modeling for economy and for forecast for major energy intensive industry. Just because the difference in our forecast 10 years ago, and also actual situation is uh, much higher than our forecast in the model for steel making and cement. So this is, uh, now we did a lot of study on this, so we jump in for the modern team, not for energy, but for economic development. So we, this is good thing, and uh, think about what's the uh, economic structure change, and also carbon pricing. That's the reason our modern team joined the study for ETS, and also carbon pricing. Maybe you heard the news uh, the recent several days for the carbon uh, price, uh, no, sorry, uh, carbon tax discussion. Actually, we're also the, the first team in China to propose carbon tax. That's in year 2006. We did the study for that and I published the report by 20, the year 2007 and year 2008. So this is, uh, we did a study for this and also some key technologies was the roadmap, whether the technology can go like that way, LED, t LED TV or LED lighting or electric car. We have a specified report on that. And in the meantime, we try to make the data transparency. Our model is open. Any model in China want to have a data from our model, just take the model away. So I think my colleague here at uh, is helping us to develop a trans trans model, in you know, a simple model, but uh, transfer all the, our data to that model. It could be freely used by other people. So this is, uh, transparency is very crucial, and also publications. Of course, we have very big book. This is uh, some Bible for <laughs> technology and modeling in China. It's a very nice one. Even myself had to read it many times. 
and also we have a uh, good, we need really good modern key for a long time. It's not the modern team only for one project, three or two years to do the modern and finish. We have to keep the modern team for 10 years, 15 years, or 20 years to do that. So we can get a very strong influence on that one. And uh, okay, let's come back to the story, what's China. The first one I already mentioned about economic structure of the nation. That means China had to change. We cannot go to that way. There's an increase in manufacturing. To export so many things to the world. If you account Chinese manufacturer for clothes, every year we can manufacture for at least one set of clothes and maybe two shoes for everybody in the world. That's an export from China. So this is not the way actually we want them to go. Uh, so we had to change something, even though this policy already focused by the central government for the last 10 years. The actual stories so were failed to do this. If you look at the data by 2011, still China increased a lot, still making cement like that. So the next one is energy saving. Efficiency policies, China did a very good job in the last five year plan. That's been from year 2005 to year 2010. Perfect story. I had published paper to review what happened for that. What kind of actual progress on energy efficiency during the five years. And the next one is renewable energy and nuclear. Uh, policy. I think so far in China also go much better than what I image in the model. So that's how I feel easy for such kind of policy. They are going to the right direction to support China go to the, the peak year by 2025. And CCS, quite controversial, even my boss. So every time I, the, my biggest difficulty is my boss, Professor Zhou oh, he always deny me. <laughs> so that, in order to reply, uh, sorry, reply uh, him or some people expert like him, we joined the CCS study. So far, we do two projects on CCS. One is for Green Gene project in China. We prepare the CCS project for ITCC. ITCC all the study operation this January. It's a, one of the best in the world so far. We have the data for that. And the second project we are doing right now is we design the CCS for one NGCC power plant inside in Beijing. Beijing now uses a lot of uh, natural gas power plant, but uh, they want to use the CCS. So we also join that project. That means maybe we are the only modern team in China can provide very good data for CCS. We got data, even have a contract for, for secret data, but uh, some data we can disclose. We have the internal story for that. So this is a success in our modeling with civil infrastructure. Even though the new model we want to talk about, maybe we will shut down all the coal-fired power plant by 2050, which will be very high cost. But we are thinking about this thing in the case if success really not succeed. We have to think about of course all the fossil fuel and power plant. And also next one is the lifestyle change. We go to a low carbon consumption. We also have a close relationship with ETS. They should provide not only for their own emission, but their products also the low carbon by using the carbon labeling uh, policies. Now, another one, of course, land use emission reduction policy so far is uh, quite poor in China. We don't have much policy on this. Most of the policy on climate change now they focus on energy. So now we are trying to push in Minister of Agriculture will do more work in the coming five year plan on this. And also climate change target. We want to learn is uh, China is a key part of that. In the, the data shows that by year 2010, I think uh, uh, if maybe Chinese colleague can remember by year 2007, we still argue whether Chinese CO2 emissions overpass the United States to be the number one in the world. We argue about that, but uh, by 2010, Chinese total CO2 emissions from energy and the cement is already account. 20, nearly 25 percent of the world, nearly equal U.S. plus EU. But the data by 2011 is terrible. China CO2 emission is already increased to be 28 percent of the global CO2 emission. That means where it's possible for one country will emit nearly one third of the global CO2 emission. That means the way I told, uh, tell the story with our minister, China must do something. Otherwise, nobody wants to <laughs> such a thing happen to allow one country to emit one third of global CO2 emission. 
then we, we, we have to do something for that. Then the last question is, uh, can we pay for that? Whether it's a very high cost to do low carbon. The answer to the question is, I think a very good news is that Chinese GDP go very fast. Now the answer to the question is, uh, yes, we can pay for that. We also calculate what's the cost for that. And come down to this uh, economic structure. Is, uh, we disclose all the data. This is very crucial. I think by 2050, Chinese economic structure is very similar with, with different countries like US. Industry will take only one third of the total GDP. But uh, the key issue is uh, so far in China, nearly 70% are only used by the industry. So then the question uh, coming back, the small part, only this small part of the sectors, even their GDP is very small, but the use, more than 50% of the total energy use in China. So the question comes from national energy administration, the policy makers or the official asking, so, okay, you said we will limit this, but how to support Chinese uh, GDP? Then we do the CG time modeling. The answer, okay, this is the picture. You should do, do more effort on such kind of technical manufacture, high tech, tech technology manufacture, and limit the energy, energy intensive industry, no more increase for that. Just keep them the, the same size. The good news is that it's a, they need such kind of detailed data for the modeling. So other modeling co team come to us to check just one sector, for example, tobacco sector. Why you still have increase so big? We, we, we limit, we, so we, we said, okay, in China, well, they, they have a lot of policy to forbid people to, to, to smoke. So you don't have much space, but they are very unhappy with us. They want a bigger market. So after such an argument, I think we get very strong confidence on sector-based uh, GDP goes right on that. So the we disclose this table to many people. Okay, come back, very big argument. This is a table we disclosed in year 2008 and year 2009. We try to say that China will peak CO2 emission by 2030. We use the same thing. That means we have studied that crude steel will peak around 600 million ton. But our big trouble is that by today, the manufacture of crude steel by 2012 is already 730 ton. So we have 730 million ton. So go beyond than this one. Then we come back to do our modeling again, whether we are wrong or not. But unfortunately, again, we come back to the data like this way. China only needs that kind of data to make a urbanization and economic development, no more than that. But the factor is that if nowadays we have a higher manufacturing than this, what happened to that? That means basically China will use 30 years to develop the whole building, everything for that, 30 years. But now if we go like this, uh, by today, 730 million pounds still, that means we shorten the period to be maybe less than 20 or even 15 years. But please remember all the manufacturers, their lifespans are more than 25 years. This coming to the story, why soon China will suffer seriously for the overs capacity. It actually, it's already happened last year. But many people say last year because of a bad situation for global economy. But this is not true. We check with the data, the, the export actually increased in last year more than 8% in China when the global economy is very bad. This is a normal growth rate, growth rate for export in China. So that means uh, it's uh, what the very bad situation for manufacturers in last year, they will keep this year, next year. It cannot be recovered. So this is a very bad story for them. I think uh, many colleagues start to talk about it. So we again review all the data in this table. Even some Fedam of cement already go to uh, 2 billion ton, much more than us. So we have to check with the data. And again, I'll come back. China only needs something like 1.6 billion ton cement. No more than that, because uh, <coughs> two billion ton is a fifty-six percent of global manufacture of cement. How make this happen? So this uh, is a very big argument. But after after the argument, we do the study for this. Now we get a strong confidence on that. 
If uh, China can do this pattern, it's a very strong factor to support China will peak CO2 emission before 2025. This is the new story for that. Okay, for energy efficiency, I don't worry about this. This table just shows what's the future energy efficiency figure based on what's the energy use for tin, steel, cement, and many of this. China could be the leading country in the world because so far we use the best available technology for manufacturing of this. So all the data show like this, exactly go like this way. The AI is very strong on this. We don't see much argument on this table. So let's just uh, tell uh, everybody here, this uh, energy efficiency was still key policy in China to do uh, cap on energy, cap on CO2. Uh, and also, let's come back, this industry, what happened in residential? I'm sorry, they still use the Chinese one, but uh, you can see the picture. Many technology, this picture show you how to reduce 80% of CO2 emission from household. This is a picture originally we designed for 2050. But good news is uh, half of the technology are already available in the market. And some of technology, for example, this one is a high efficiency electric appliance. It comes through very quickly. Our model, for example, we designed a super high efficiency TV, that's LED TV. We are come through to the market, o occupy 35% of the market by 2015. But data shows by today, in Doha, I used the, the slide. It's a, a copy from the website. It's an uh, internet uh, shop, sh shop to show the LED TV audio account of the, the market share more than 60%. LED TV, no, sorry, LED lighting by end of last year, this go to similar price with uh, normal lighting in China. So you can see how much they can go ahead if the technology will tell the people this is right thing and the super high efficiency air conditioner. It coming soon. And also the best refrigerator with the best efficiency refrigerator is in China. It's already sell in the market. If you go to there to check, they only use 0 0.3 kilowatt hour per day. When the size of the, uh, the refrigerator is nearly 300 liters. It's really amazing if uh, we can do such kind of thing. This can happen. So I also get a very big confidence on this picture in the household. We can do a lot. It depends on policy, on how to make that happen. And the uh, next picture is for transport. We also did a specified uh, transport modeling team, a modeling thing. It's a, uh, one way to do the model for, for uh, the government is uh, the biggest argument is uh, <coughs> our model actually, let me see. Okay. Now our model actually, we assume by 2030, China will have for uh, Vehicle is more than 400 million. It's a very big number. Uh, but uh, when we do the modeling in China, it's only uh, 50 million vehicles. So it's many, many, many times more than today. So the government official is actually the people from National Energy, them change ask us, that's impossible. We cannot make that happen. But actual situation is <laughs> now that the manufacturer by 2011 or 2010, this go much beyond than this. But our study is based on the, what's the ownership in household by urban and rural. And uh, in, because in rural area, they don't have very good services for public transport. They have to rely on the private transport, such kind of car use. And the people in rural area can also get rich if you follow the Chinese government policy on the income increase. The new government announced that by 2020, the, the, the income for, for household will be doubled. Uh, and this is easy to, to get rich in, even in rural areas. So when we think about this, okay, by 2030, the total number of vehicles can go more than 400 million cars, trucks, buses together. But uh, what kind of thing we can do with that? We have a transport model to say, okay, if you have a private car, we'll limit your use for the car, not encourage the use. One way is to increase the price of gasoline. Another one is increase the price of parking fee to be similar to that, that in Tokyo. Whether you can do that? Actually, we do this policy by 20, uh, 2002 for Beijing government. All the policies just uh, uh, accepted by Beijing government by 20, uh, 2009. So the parking fee increase to be quite expensive, maybe more expensive than you take taxi to there. 
to park in your car. So, and together with uh, other policies, for example, fuel efficiency, we have a lot of uh, uh, very unsaving cars. So, this uh, we can do with that, and also uh, with the, the public transport, we also have very strong policy on MRT. That means basically means subway and the metro system. China now is the biggest uh, country to develop uh, metro system today, even in Beijing. But today, we still have 12 subway lines under construction. So every year, we have uh, three to four lines finished. So this is a target in Beijing. And uh, finally, Beijing will have uh, more than 1,200 kilo kilometers subway system. It will be the biggest uh, city in the world to have our uh, own subway system. So this is the, the, the government can put a lot of effort to get for, on this together with the biofuel electric car and a fuel cell car. This is a long term, but the electric car is coming to the reality by today. Okay, so and uh, we also have to design something for the transport. This is a picture for, for Beijing government to do a public transport. One well designed. A mistake by Beijing government is uh, they did really want to give a city to be a city suitable for car transport. So they make the road wide wide and make the fans between the road so the car can run very fast. But it's a mistake we already realized. So now they come back to make a very wide road for rapid public transport. So this is the line we, we draw three years ago. You at that time many people don't like that. But today the government is using such kind of picture. Then also come back to power generation like a success stories. For for a long time we talked about, about with our power generation colleagues that the coal fire power plant very soon will stop increase. But I think that kind of picture makes them amazing. They, they're surprised. Because uh, remember that uh, between uh, year 2006 to year 2009, every year China increased nearly 100 gigawatt, which is a double of the total power generation capacity in Australia. So every year we increase such a big amount of uh, coal fire power plant. But uh, we said it's uh, very soon come to the peak. So coal fire power plant could peak before 2020. There's no more than that. Actually, last year, the coal fire power plant power is decreased uh, because of a lot of hydro. So I think about the, the future picture. If this part is used uh, to part, uh, some, something for success, like this one, we have a virtual supercritical, supercritical ITCC this is a fuel cell equipped with a CCS. Then we can certainly can do a lot of CO2 emission reduction. We try to disclose our data. And in the meantime, one big story for today is uh, I think you, from your TV you see that uh, Beijing is getting to be the most, most polluted city in the world. I think it may be number one in the world. <laughs> um, so the, the air pollution is so bad in last seven months is terribly. So I'm very happy I'm here in Canberra. So enjoy <laughs> the blue sky. So, and I believe very soon uh, the, to improve the air quality will be very, very strong policy in China. Because the top guys in China said they will ask China to become a beautiful China. But uh, now we give an indicator to explain what's the meaning of beautiful China. Air quality is uh, one of the key indicators for that. So, when we do low carbon, it's not only for CO2 emission. We take the sulfur emission, NOx, black carbon, PM2.5, and the mercury. Everything should be uh, go to an uh, environment-friendly uh, world. And in the meantime, for any saving, and security issues, we can find a really combination. Low carbon development is very good for low uh, energy security because the energy could be localized with renewable energy and other source to do such kind of thing. Another big issue in China is uh, water pollution. I think a very bad uh, situation in the China's western area. But when we do low carbon technology options, we really can find some combination with uh, use much less water. In the meantime, we can reduce CO2 emission. And also we try to identify with the key technology in China. We have a list of the low carbon technology. We really want to impact the policy making process in the Ministry of Science and Technology, ask them to do the long term planning on technology and D, really focus on such kind of list. Good news is that also the publication from China Academy of Science, they show the key technology in China by 2050. Good news is that half of that, 50% of the, their technology list is really inside our list. It's a low carbon technology. Okay, this is a 
very good combination for that. And uh, can we do it peak before 2025? And also, now economic structure with our conclusion said this will change soon. Very soon, sometimes, maybe before, within two or three years. This will happen. So we, we need to push the policy go that way. But if the policy don't go that way, we just wait for the market. Market will answer the question, because there's no market for, for additional energy intensive products. And also, next one is technology ready. And the uh, economic ability, China's getting from GDP, now with the second uh, biggest uh, GDP in the world. And we can use part of the GDP for low carbon development. Based on calculation, we have enough money for, to do that. And also, uh, global target need us to move. I think China negotiators are thinking about what's the role of China to play in the negotiation process. I think nowadays uh, going to much more positive. They want to join the, um, the group to do low carbon thing. And also low carbon development is getting to be everybody know about that in China. This is now not a very new topic for this. And we can say, and this is uh, the, the figure we show that uh, let's still limit the energy use in China. We just release the cap on energy by 2015. How to limit the cap? Actually, we use this figure to set up some sector, you, they cannot increase, just start to decrease. This is, a, this is a fundamental story, we do that. And this is picture showing you the cost, how to limit the energy use by different sectors. And there was the additional cost we should pay for that. The figure shows that uh, actually the total increase uh, money for low carbon is not very right big. It's something like uh, two trillion per year. But now that we can't do this because China's total GDP is already more than uh, 50 trillion per year. So two trillion and the amount that is very small part of that. So let's do with this one. Okay, I think I will finish off of this. This is uh, the slide I just want to show how big GDP is going to. Maybe by 2015, the total GDP can go to nearly 80 trillion. Again, two trillion among 80 trillion is a very small number. Let's do it. So the funding countries is uh, we can do. But, but this goes out there like this. I think nearly we get succeed. Many people get convinced and we need strong policy. In the meantime, if you look at the Chinese export data, the biggest part for export increase is a low carbon technology related thing. If you look at the global market, that originally uh, China export a lot of clothes, shoes, but today China is export something like a cement manufacturing technology, coal fire power plant technology. In Indonesia, 100% of their coal fire power plant equipment comes from China. So this is a way for us to do local carbon sink or the future economy to do. Okay, thank you very much. I have a, a show, a, a see if Frank show me that. Uh, I'll stop here. Thank you.